Thank you very much, and uh, you're all very welcome here. And it's a real pleasure to come and be able to talk to you about what I think is the, perhaps the newest cohort in, Edim in the University of Edinburgh, the Their World Edinburgh Birth Cohort. So to orientate you to the, to the group of children that we're really interested in studying, I've shown this picture here, which is a, a, a picture of a very premature baby born at 26 weeks of intergestation of the mother's pregnancy. And you can see that the blue tube at the top of the screen is a, is a breathing tube. The baby's on a ventilator. That's dad's hand against the baby's foot, just to give you an idea of the size. And we've been very interested to study what, what life is like for this group of children who are born three to four months sooner than they should have been. Why did we want to study this? Well, it's a huge problem. So around the world every year, there are 15 million children born preterm like this. 60% of them are born in 10, uh, 10 countries, and perhaps unsurprisingly, they tend to be in low- and middle-income countries. But the United States is a big contributor to preterm birth, and in fact, so are we. So the, the depth of the blue on that map is the amount of children born preterm. And so within Europe, we sit in a, in, a, in a middling group, which means that around 6 to 7% of all children in the UK are born preterm. The very best of Europe is about 5%, and the very worst rates in the world are about 18 to 25% in sub-Saharan Africa. And so this is a huge global problem. And in the countries that measure the uh, rates of preterm birth, in fact, there are increases year on year. So despite strenuous efforts of the research community, we're not yet tackling the, the event of preterm birth itself. And with advances in neonatal intensive care, more and more children are surviving. And so therefore, it becomes more and more important to study their outcomes. Now, one of the most informative sources of information about this group actually comes from a UK, a UK and Ireland cohort. And here, the investigators recruited every single child born at 26 weeks gestation or less over a 10-month period in 1995. And what they were able to do is characterize the mums and the babies in great detail and to follow them over time. And this graph here just shows, shows their performance when they got to school at the age of six, compared to a group of completely healthy children who were born at term and recruited from the classroom that, sh that they shared with these uh, ex-preterm children. And so for every week of gestation at birth, from 25 weeks, 24 and 23, shown on that graph, there was a reduction in their cognitive abilities. So where 100 there on the y-axis is what the, the population norm is, this group of children, it turned out from this cohort, uh, were performing consider considerably less uh, than they would have done if they'd been born at term. And this cohort has been incredibly informative over the years and studied in great detail, as, as you have. And it's really helped shape education policy, health policy, and further research, importantly. Now, congratulations to the investigators of this cohort, because they've been able to secure funds to follow the children up. And just last month, they published the 19-year outcomes of this group of children born in 1995. And so on the top graph there is their co cognitive scores, uh, where, again, 100 is the normal, and you'll see that they, the, the thick band of that graph settles around 85. And then the bottom panel there is the, babies who, the children who were born at term, but recruited at the same time at the age of six, uh, from sharing the classroom with those, with those preterm babies. And it shows, in fact, that over that 19 years, they start off with difficulty that's detectable by the age of two, and they don't get better, and they don't get worse. So it seems that this trajectory for learning abilities is set pretty early on, and it, doesn't get, it neither gets better nor worse as they grow through childhood, at least according to this UK and Ireland um, cohort. And smaller studies have found actually there's a host of difficulties that are associated with, those, with that learning, with the cog uh, cognitive impairment. So there are global and specific learning difficulties. They tend to have more trouble with mathematics, for example. They have difficulties with planning with inhibition, memory problems, and verbal fluency. They tend to be inattentive without being hyperactive. They have social difficulties, which to the children themselves, actually they rate very highly as being extremely important to them. Autism spectrum is a bit more common among pre, uh, children who are born preterm. And as the oldest cohorts from around the world have started to mature into their 40s and 50s, it turns out that they have an increased risk of having difficulty with, with psychiatric problems. 
And so this problem of being born too soon seems to exert a lifelong risk across the whole life course that needs to be investigated so that we can improve the trajectory of this group of children. So they're the medical, and they're the medical questions that we have, but actually I work on a neonatal intensive care unit, and these are a list of some of the questions that I, I get presented with by parents on a daily basis. Will she be able to speak? What if he never walks? Will he be able to feed himself when he's older? Will she survive? Do you think she'll go to mainstream school? And if she does, will she be able to learn? And will she be able to make friends? And the common question that every single parent asks, what can they do to help? And so the parent perspective of this is very focused on prognosis and very pro focused on trying to find interventions to improve outcomes. So what are we doing in the Their World Edinburgh Birth Cohort to try and solve some of these problems? Well, we're using MRI scanning, very sophisticated forms of MRI scanning that we're able to do at the university here to try and understand what's the effect on the developing brain structure of babies, if, if, for babies who are born too, too soon. We're then using that data and combining it with other types of data, biological information and social information, to try and find out what it is about that early exposure to life outside the womb that leads to risk, and importantly, what is it about those babies who do well, because there are many of them, what, what confers resilience for those babies, because we need to tap into that. And finally, how can we identify the babies who might benefit from early interventions? So a big problem, problem we all have recognized from that list I showed you is that many of those diagnoses don't surface until children get to school and the primary school teacher picks something up that's not quite right or the parents are picking something up that's not quite right. And that means that from birth until the age of six, seven, eight, there's been no extra support added. And yet there are now interventions that may well be beneficial if we can work out who should get them. So I just want to show you some of the work that we've done to address each of those things as, as examples. And so this is uh, MRI scans of um, sections through the brain going this way um, from a baby who was born at 24 weeks and whose mum and dad were generous enough to let us take images um, as that baby grew up through their time on the neonatal unit, right up to their time when they were going home at 39 weeks. And you'll know that normal pregnancy is 40 weeks. And so this slide show, illustrates very clearly that the brain is undergoing tremendous changes in size, complexity, over this 14-week period, more so than at any other time in, in, in postnatal life. And so we've been very keen to ask the questions, well, what is it about the life in an incubator versus the womb that colors that process? Scaling up now, we've, uh, it's important to go beyond studying individuals and to be able to develop the technologies that allow us to study cohorts. And so this is some work that we've done where we've grouped, an, we've grouped the MRI scans of a number of babies who were born following a healthy pregnancy and asked, what's average brain anatomy? What does the normal brain look like? Because once we've defined normal, we can start to define abnormal. And so this is an average map of brain structure where each color shows a specific part of the brain that governs a particular function. And we can use this sort of information to start to ask really clear questions and get clear answers about what are the brain structures that underlie problems or resilience. And we can go a bit deeper. So now this is brain connections. The top, pick, the top row is anatomy. This is now connections. And it allows us to assess from the developing baby brain how well the brain, the brain is wired uh, between those areas of, of connections. And this leads to really exciting information and data like this. So this is the average brain change in connectivity, where so if you consider the brain is a network of, a, of cables that transfer information from one part of the brain to another for processing and ultimately executing functions or movement. Some particular uh, areas of the brain seem particularly vulnerable, and this has led to new ways of, of understanding the, uh, the basis of some of the impairments that the children get. So what about the causes? What about risk and resilience? And so one of the commonest causes of a, ba of a mum going into labor too soon or too early is that bugs that normally live on the skin or the reproductive tract of men and women can actually access the uterus and trigger a preterm labor. So bugs on this diagram here are shown as little yellow dots. They normally reside in the reproductive tract. But in some pregnancies, they breach the cervix, get into the uterus, surround the baby, and this leads to preterm labor. 
And we wanted to ask the question, well, that causes a certain amount of a process called inflammation. So if you get a bacterial infection, for example, you get a fever, you feel unwell for a few days, you go to bed, and it all gets better. But that fever and illness has been due to inflammation. And we wanted to know whether the inflammation that the fetus experiences in this situation affects their brain, because we know that inflammation at other stages in the life course certainly does. And so we are part of the, one of the first studies from the Their World Edinburgh Birth Cohort was to um, assess that, to answer that question. And so we took the placental tissues from the mums, because they generously gave consent for us to do that, put them under a microscope, and worked out which babies or which mums had, had gone into labor because of infection. And so the blue dots on the slide on your right there are, are signs of, on the top panel, uh, the, the amnion and cor the, uh, water, the, the membranes around the baby, that are filled with blue dots, which is the mum's inflama inflammatory system trying to fight off infection. And the one below that is a section through an umbilical cord where the baby's own uh, cells are trying to fight off infection. So we were able to work out from this, from looking at the placentas, which of the babies that we were looking after on the neonatal intensive care unit had experienced this inflammation in the womb and which hadn't. The ones on the left there are normal, uh, normal, normal sections through placentas. And then we asked the mums and dads if they would bring their babies back for an MRI scan. This is a, seems like a big deal, but actually the babies just go off to sleep after they've had a feed, they're swaddled. The mums are absolutely instrumental in uh, facilitating this process. Um, and we put those yellow, uh, yellow uh, earmuffs on to block out the sound, and the babies go off to sleep. And that's us just um, putting a baby into a little crib that goes into the MRI scanner. And from that, we get really detailed pictures of the brain. And we analyzed this in the following way. So we took all the group of babies whose mums had had this infection, which is called choriamnionitis, and all the groups of the babies whose mums did not have that problem. And uh, they're shown there as a single image, but this is, that's just representative and for sake of clarity on the slide. But we could merge them all together to ask, what are the brain connections that differ between the two, if any? So there the data merged together. We then strip away the parts of the brain that we're not interested in, in this particular test, and then just examine what's called the white matter skeleton. So this can be the sort of highways of connections in the brain, like if you like the M8 or the M1 of connections. Um, and they're the ones that we're really interested in to know whether they're altered by, uh, by this exposure to infection. And this, this is the result. So this is on average from a group of babies who had and had not had that exposure, where yellow is the normal skeleton. So that's like looking at a Google map of the UK and looking at the maps of roads. And blue is those that were altered, where the con connection strength was less in those babies who'd been born following infection in the womb. And so this really focused great attention for the first time on trying to work out the babies that are running into trouble in the womb, because for a proportion of them, they're probably better off being delivered or recommending early delivery to the mums. And it showed that the difficulties that preterm babies get when they get older start in, in the womb for a, for a significant proportion. So how are we taking this forward? Well, we've, recruited, we've started to recruit to the Their World Edinburgh Birth Cohort, and I say world-leading because although there are, many, there are many birth cohorts around the world, each asking specific and separate questions and designed for specific purposes, but this really is the, 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 the one that, to the best of our knowledge, is collecting the most detailed information about, a, 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 about, about 500 of these families um, over the next uh, few years or so. And what we want to do is place the families at the heart of a research journey that's enjoyable for them and includes imaging to, to get to understand brain anatomy, captures information about the biology, their psychological outcomes, the socioeconomic circumstances of the family, which are likely to be very important, and also how the children do in the long run. Uh, I think we're all most interested, actually, in, in how they get on at school, whether they form uh, fall into gainful employment or whether they have difficulties, whether they settle down in relationships and so forth. And this type of information is really lacking in, uh, in, in, a, in a research climate where often we have to design projects that are two or three years long. Uh, cohorts are absolutely invaluable for being able to get the, get the long picture. Uh, now, not for uh, reading all of this, but this is our plan. We're, we're seeing the babies at, at five different time points over the first five years. Uh, and collecting lots of information about their social, social situation, the placenta, the cord blood, the uh, MRI for brain, 
DNA for genetic studies, and so forth. And our hope is very much that we'll be able to uh, get funding to continue this and follow this group of Scottish children uh, way into adulthood. If anyone would like to know any more, we have a website. Uh, that's the address at the top, and I can certainly give that uh, out to you if, you if you don't have time to write it down at the moment. But all our, our, our study is described there with some of our findings. We produce a biannual newsletter, which we'd also be really happy to circulate. And part of the part of the way that we try to make this enjoyable for the families is to bring them together and uh, in, into, a, into a community of parents of children who were born preterm. Um, and so we have an annual party every year where we get together and say thank you. So just to finish off, um, the cohort has, a, has a really allowed us to st establish that MRI scanning of the preterm infant is, is the best possible method for detecting the sorts of brain changes that take place after preterm birth. And it's showing signs now of being able to be a test that we can apply in the newborn period that can then be predictive of their um, abilities later on, which is what parents want. One of the early studies has shown that atypical brain development in this group of children, at least for a proportion, begins in the womb. And this really focuses further research attention on trying to work out which those babies are. And by studying babies and parents in detail and over time, we are being able to understand, I hope, more the risk and resilience for brain development that children born too small or too soon experience. We'll be able to test through the cohort structure, this long, long picture, the interaction between these birth events, which seem so dramatic, and later childhood events on influencing important measures of uh, long-term health and disease. And finally, through the cohort, an important wing of, of the study is to, be able to, uh, is to be able to discover new treatments and be able to work out which babies may stand to benefit the most and therefore accelerate new treatments to ch uh, children in early childhood. So I just want to finish with some of our oldest members of our cohort. <laughs> um, this is Jessica and Rebecca, who were born three months early, um, a pair of twins, um, who you'll, I'm sure you'll agree are thriving in every way. And it's equally important for us to study this group of preterm children to understand what it is about them uh, that makes them thrive and succeed despite these early adversities. <laughs>